This video has been funded in part by the Guild via Patreon. Check out the links in the description or at the end of this video for more details. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Gilder and welcome back to another Pros vs Cons review. When Warriors Orochi 4 was announced, it was like a beacon of light after Dynasty Warriors 9's disastrous launch. I always joke that it's like somebody pressed the Dynasty Warriors 9 is failing button. And then when it launched, it was kind of lackluster. But was it really that bad? We waited so long for Warriors Orochi 4. As more and more news came out about it, there was more and more disappointment. And with this entry including only the characters from Dynasty Warriors 8 Empires and Samurai Warriors 4 2, that didn't leave lots of trust in the fans' eyes. Though we would now have the Greek gods joining the fray along with the demons and mystics from the previous games. So, how is this game bad again? Well, let's find out with the first pro. Straight off the bat, we have a game that looks great. The lighting just makes this game stand out from Dynasty Warriors 8 and 9. It seems like they brought over what they had from Samurai Warriors 4 and improved it ever so slightly. I always thought that game looked really good, so I'm glad they kept with that engine. Especially after the dull colors of Dynasty Warriors 9, I had some concerns, but everything pops. They also got rid of special attacks and replaced it with magic attacks. I really like this because the moves are pretty useful depending on which sacred treasure you have. I really liked using the Trident and Leviathan. I found myself using the magic attacks a lot more than I used the special attacks in Warriors Orochi 1, 2, and 3. Definitely a welcome change to the usual format. Everything we know and love about the usual Warriors gameplay is also here. Regular and charge attacks, Muso attacks, calling your horse, mid-stage missions. This is a pretty fun Warriors game all things considered. It really helps to keep the spirit alive, especially after Dynasty Warriors 9. On top of being able to distribute some of your extra extra experience to your unlocked officers, you can also send groups out on training sessions that can either focus on experience, bond, or weapon gathering. Depending on the intensity, it will take either three or five stages before they return with the spoils. This is a big help to grind in this game. You also get two other moves that guarantee experience scrolls to be dropped. The first being your unity magic, which drops a spirit ball down to the ground and everyone who dies either gives you gems or experience or both. The other being Chain Muso Attacks. Once you've completed a Muso Attack, if you switch and use another Muso Attack with your next character, it will gather enemies around you, and anyone who dies, again, drops some good spoils. Above having the usual mid-game missions, you also have three goals for every stage, similar to what we had in Dynasty Warriors 8. The nice thing they did with these is that you don't have to keep pausing your game in order to see how you're doing with them. You can set it up so that it appears on screen with a progression bar, and you don't have to have this either. Either. So, if you're replaying a stage where you've already completed all three goals, you don't have to see it, and you can just play through it at your own pace. It's little things like this that make me really enjoy the grind. Con! One thing that I've enjoyed to an extent was the story in Orochi games. They've never really been anything too substantial, but enough enjoyment where I could get a kick out of playing through it. Warriors Orochi 1 had a decent enough story. Warriors Orochi 2 was a rehash with more characters, and Warriors Orochi 3 was the best and is the best. Warriors Orochi 4 is kinda... maybe... the worst. Now, if you want to experience this train wreck on your own, just know that I'm going into some spoiler territory here, so skip ahead if you don't want to hear this. Just know that the story is, uh, pretty bad. There was so much potential with the introduction of Greek gods, and they fucked that up! What pisses me off is that they showed off everything we need to know about the story before the game even came out. We already knew about Zeus and how everyone comes back together once more after going back to their respective timelines and losing their memory of each other. I like the idea of them having amnesia about the whole Orochi war they experienced in the last three games, but all of that becomes irrelevant after a couple of stages. They literally say things like, you look familiar, but I don't know where you're from. I think we fought alongside each other before. But then maybe three stages later, they're saying stuff like, yeah, we're in a completely different dimension and I fully remember us fighting Orochi together to save the world before. And this is all in the first couple of chapters of a five chapter story. This is chapter five revelations here. We shouldn't be figuring this stuff out in chapter two. Everything feels like it's just rushed and shoved out the window of a 10 story building. I've said it before that they blow their load way too early with things like the gods shown right away, Tadakatsu and Lubu fighting in literally the first stage, also Lubu showing off his deification form in the same fight. Everything about this story feels thrown together, like they just put a bunch of plot ideas into a hat and drew them at random and said, well, let's do this one next. 
there's a lot that I would do to change the story for the better. And I'm gonna get this shit off my chest because I've been sitting on it for nearly two full years. First off, it is not okay that we get to see the Greek gods right away. I'd cut that completely out and start off with Tarakatsu, Naomasa, and Naotora running into a battlefield full of fog only to find another army. Though I would make it the Wu army as you fight them in the second stage rather than Lubu's army. This is where they would say something along the lines of, this army seems familiar but I can't quite put my finger on it. This would be a small faction of the Wu army as well. The only playable characters would be Sun Quan, Yan Xu, and Zhou Tai. During the battle, they might say something like, the enemy's weapons are different than what I've seen before. After the battle, Sun Quan and Tadakatsu talk to each other, and they say they should combine their forces to figure out what's going on. The next few battles are with various other small armies that have one or two more playable characters to unlock. Maybe running into Yuan Shao, who wouldn't bring anyone else with him to become playable, and decides to join your forces to help you because he's a noble, and it would be in poor taste to leave those lost without a guide. The next stage is where you'd find Ranmaru fighting the forces of Wei. You assist Ranmaru and feel bad he's fighting with such a small unit against a whole army. Ranmaru mentions that he was separated from Nobunaga's forces, to which Naomasa says that he thought Nobunaga died in a fire. Ranmaru says something like, where did you hear such horrible rumors from? This solidifying the space-time continuum has been broken to the player without dumbing it down and having the characters say it outright that they're in a different universe or something stupid like that. Finally, on the fourth stage, this is where the team finds Lubu's forces. Even though Lubu's army is smaller, the allies are struggling to whittle down their defenses. That being said, it is working slowly. About halfway through the stage, demons appear as a third party. They're incredibly powerful and led by Daji and Diamondback. At first, they fight against both armies, but Daji goes to speak with Lubu and says that she will help him win the fight if he helps her resurrect the strongest being in the world. Lubu agrees so that he can challenge this being, and the third party turns from yellow to red. Tadakatsu and Sun Quan decide that the battle is lost and start retreating. Yuki blocks the exit, and Tadakatsu and Sun Quan are then helped by Perseus. After this battle, Perseus explains who Daji is and what her intentions are. He also shows them a single bracelet that he believes will help them find their way back home. He also provides them with the sacred treasures, and this is where we would unlock those abilities. This would conclude the first chapter. Starting the second chapter, the army goes on the search for bracelets. All in all, the next few stages only serve as a way to unlock some more characters, rather than something of too much substance. These officers should make sense based on who we've already got. So I would say even though we may fight armies like the Takeda or Wei, it should be saving officers without large factions or friends and allies of those we already have. So maybe some more Wu officers and finally finding Ieyasu and Hanzo, who tells you that they heard rumors of a strong army led by a god who wears a bracelet in the shape of a snake. This leads you to a battle against Daji's army, but this time led by Kiyomori. As you get close to the end of the battle, Kiyomori calls for Lu Bu, who appears in his deification form. The the army retreats again. This would be the first stage where no new characters are unlocked, but it would also be the first stage where we see someone in deification and find out that the enemy army also has sacred treasures. Most of the story would continue here as it happens in the actual game, but with no reference to them figuring out who they are. They would also have fewer interactions with the gods and more with the demons until about the midway point of the fourth chapter. This is where we would see Ares leading his own army with the end of the fourth chapter being a big battle between our army, Ares' army, and Daji's. After this, Chapter 5 would be where the shit hits the fan, and Zeus and Athena appear and essentially explain everything about the space-time continuum and how they're trying to stop Daji from resurrecting Orochi yet again. This is also where Odin would appear and Loki reveals himself. Daji resurrects Orochi and you kill him and that leads to Orochi X. Odin reveals that he needs Orochi X's power in order to consume the power of Yggdrasil and become the strongest god. The second last battle is again a three-way battle between Odin's army and Orochi X. You defeat Orochi X and this releases the power for Odin to steal. The final fight is a pursuit stage, fighting against waves and waves of enemies. This part of the stage would feel like you can actually catch up with Odin, but it's designed so you can't actually do that. Then a cutscene happens where Odin reaches Yggdrasil and uses Orochi X's power to consume Yggdrasil and morph into a different Odin. This would be an unlockable deification for Odin where he essentially becomes Odin X. 
Odin says he will now kill Zeus, Athena, and all of the warriors that have gathered here to defeat him. Loki stands up against him and says that he thought Odin's intentions were just to become the strongest, so that the Norse gods could stand above the Greek. But now that he knows Odin wants to kill everyone, he can't do that after building relationships with these warriors. Literally everyone gathers on the battlefield, which expands beyond the map that you were originally fighting on, and you have to travel to various parts of the map in order to fight the teleporting deified Odin. You finally defeat him and place the power of Yggdrasil back where it belongs. Zeus gives a heartwarming speech to Odin about working together rather than apart, and Odin accepts that. They then offer to send the warriors back to where they belong, and they decline because they've become strong friends and they want to build a combined world together. This would then lead into Ultimate, where instead of being a reimagining of the ending of Vanilla, it will be a continuation. The combined groups have rebuilt society enough that they are surviving in this new world when all of a sudden the world starts cracking open and falling apart. Gaia's spirit appears and tells Zeus and the leaders that this is because no two timelines are supposed to be combined for this long and this world is slowly imploding. Hades would come into the story because he wants to take the power of these two imploding worlds and fight against Zeus to become the god of gods. Beyond this, not a whole lot would change. Some officers would band together with Hades, most of these being canonically evil characters like Dong Zhuo because they think Hades would actually be a better leader than Zeus. These characters would be taken away as playable until you finish the ultimate story. The fight ensues and you defeat Hades and everyone is sent back to their own timelines with their memory forgotten once again and the land of the mystics saved. I know I spent a lot of time explaining a new story, but I feel like it's a lot stronger than what we got and has less plot twists as well. Let me know your thoughts on my reimagining of the story in the comments below. Pro. Now, I may have complained about the story for a lot longer than I should have, but Ultimate's story really helps the base game. Everything Ultimate does to rectify what the vanilla did, I'm very grateful for. The only reason why I gave an idea of Ultimate's story in my last point was because the story in Ultimate doesn't really work that well with the story I had. But this story isn't the only thing Ultimate does to redeem for us. With the Ultimate package, it brought back promotions. Yes, promoting officers from Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate was taken out from Warriors Orochi 4 Vanilla. I was kind of surprised because everyone enjoyed leveling up their characters to level 1000. And the training groups I mentioned before, in Vanilla, it only allowed up to 3 people to be sent out on training. Now you can send 5 per group, meaning you can send 15 people out in total on training. We can also swap our sacred treasures, so if you like using two characters who, in the vanilla version, use the same treasure, you can now change that. I always liked Shahodun and Keiji Maida, who both use the trident, so I swapped Shahodun to Leviathan, and now it feels so much better. The other thing with this is that some characters just didn't feel right with certain treasures, so changing that up can make them more fun to play as too. We also get some returning characters. Vanilla only had the Dynasty and Samurai characters alongside the Orochi characters, so we were missing all of the guest characters characters that were introduced in 3. With Ultimate, we get to see the return of Achilles, Joan of Arc, and Ryu Hayabusa. We also have three new gods with Gaia, Hades, and Yang Jian. All of these characters are a welcome return or addition, especially Achilles, which myself and fans were confused by his exclusion. Yang Jian also comes with his own new sacred treasure and deification form. Ultimate introduces some secret weapons as well that are incredibly powerful. You create them by crafting, similar to the strongest weapons in Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate, and you obtain the materials in this entry's answer to gauntlet mode. If it wasn't for ultimate, this game probably wouldn't be as good as it is. Come on! Now, even though we got Ryu, Achilles, and Joan back, we're still missing characters from past Orochi games. Ayane, Kasumi, Rachel, Momiji, Sturk, and Sofitia are all missing. I mentioned this in my mini-review of Warriors Orochi 4 Ultimate, so if you haven't seen that, you definitely should. But Sofitia is the only one I'm fine not having considering it's someone else's IP. But the others are all from Koei, so I don't see why we couldn't include them. Not to mention that this game came out after Warriors All-Stars, and none of those characters are included. Oka, Oro, Tokitsugu, Opuna, Sophia, Plekta, Hajime Arima, Darius, William Adams, Nobunyaga Oda, Mary Rose, Honoka, Millennia, Negrina, Ryo, Arnis, and Christophorus could have definitely been added as well as the three original characters Tamaki, Shiki, and Setsuna. 
finally, there's the biggest offender of all, the one I continuously scold Koei for not including, the characters that had every right to be included in the vanilla release, and especially the ultimate. All of the characters above could have been forgiven if these characters were included, but no, Koei had to continue to forget about this game, its characters, and how much they mean to not only me, but the community as well. These characters would have been the ones included in Samurai Warriors Spirit of Sanada, Masayuki Sanada, Chacha, and Sasuke. It would have also been cool to see Katsuyori Takeda and Hidetada Tokugawa, but I'm okay with them not being included because they were just some custom characters that were made playable. But not only missing those three characters, we could have had young, teen, and mature Yukimura. This would have been great if we had these characters on top of the roster that we already have. The main reason why I complain about this is because we see Warriors Orochi as a big culmination of all things Koei. After Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate, we love the idea of other characters from other games joining the fight against the Serpent King. Now the Orochi series is looking less like the biggest crossover of all time and more like an excuse to make us buy yet another game with all the same characters we already use in other games. Pro. I know I already mentioned how Ultimate redeemed the lackluster release of Vanilla Warriors Orochi 4, but one thing that was included was the replacement of Gauntlet Mode. In my review of Warriors Orochi 3, I mentioned how I disliked this mode and never really had much want to play it, other than to unlock the trophies or achievements and getting Hundun. But Warriors Orochi 4 Ultimate's answer made things more interesting than Gauntlet Mode. Infinite Mode had a similar idea where it threw you into a map filled with officers for you to take out and hope for them to join your team. The end goal is to escape gather materials for stronger weapons, and grind out those levels. The main difference is that instead of activating a multitude of portals all over the map in the hopes that one of them will lead you to the exit, you have various towers with different challenges to accomplish before you're even able to leave. This can range from racking up a kill count, to purifying or destroying anchors, to destroying pots all over the battlefield. You also can't see the whole map just like in Gauntlet Mode, so you have to traverse the whole battlefield before you're able to find the anchors or pots you need to purify or destroy. You also don't see where the exit is until you've completed your task, so you may have to do some more running around before you're even able to locate the exit. There's also a time limit to complete these challenges, however, after you win the stage, the time limit is null. You can jump back in and grind to your heart's content. I know a lot of people were clamoring for Gauntlet Mode, but this is leagues better. Con! Alright, I've mentioned quite the list of cons already, but there is a bunch more smaller things that I can't help but dislike. First of all, I mentioned how the treasures were a lot of fun to use, especially after Ultimate allowed you to swap them out. But there's one thing that really annoys me about swapping, and that's that you don't get a different unique magic with the different treasures. There's not a whole lot of treasures, and they don't have different unique magic with the DLC ones, but that extra little bit of detail would have been appreciated. On top of that, the Orochi character's Muso attacks don't differ when you activate Rage. The Dynasty and Samurai characters both have different attacks. This would have been another way to have added extra value and detail to what we already had. There is literally no point in using a Rage Muso while using an Orochi character. They also changed the weapon fusion system. Previous games allowed you to take attributes from one weapon and add it to another. The new system shouldn't even be called fusion, but it is. What you do in this system is break down your old weapons for pieces of that attribute. You then require a certain amount of pieces to either add or upgrade that attribute on another weapon. This is just more meaningful meaningless grinding for no reason. This doesn't feel like an evolution of the system, but a de-evolution. Speaking of de-evolutions, remember how Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate was a smorgasbord of nostalgia by offering crossover weapons and outfits along with past outfits and special costumes as DLC? Yeah, we get none of that. All we get are the quote-unquote legendary outfits. Calling these things legendary is a legendary failure. For the Dynasty Warriors characters, the legendary outfits are the modern day outfits from Dynasty Warriors 8. For the Samurai characters are the kimonos from Samurai Warriors 4 Empires. For the Orochi characters, it's just the palette swap from the previous fucking games. We get no past costumes at all. None. In fact, we get a couple of Dynasty Warriors 9 outfits. That would have been a potential plus if we got more than 6. All of them being female characters, and it's not even all the female characters that get to wear their new costumes. Now, we do get some cool Greek and Norse outfits for some of the characters, but most of them are the Japanese fan favorite characters. I don't know why Koei has been chicken picking who gets outfits. Meanwhile, in the last game, everyone got outfits. Very few only had one DLC outfit, and for the most part, it was just because they 
they were new and didn't have previous outfits to wear. We also had the world's worst character select in the vanilla version. We have the ring selection now in the ultimate expansion, but anyone who didn't buy that is stuck with the stupid old selection. This should have been a patch, not something you had to pay money for. And worst of all, they didn't even include the random button. This is literally the worst Orochi game of all time. In the end, Warriors Orochi 4 is different. I want to love this game after playing Dynasty Warriors 9, but I have so many criticisms that I can't help but think this is just the worst entry. That being said, when I play it, I have fun. I don't mind its shortcomings because if I'm having fun, then I'm having fun. That's a very important factor to me as far as how I feel about this game and how I would ultimately rate it. Pun absolutely intended, even though originally it was unintentional. You see, my biggest gripe, as you can tell by the length of this video, is the game's story. Usually after I've finished a Warriors game story, I just don't care about it anymore. I've always been a gameplay over story kind of person. There have been a few exceptions, but Warriors games have always been less about the story and more about the gameplay. It wasn't really until games like Dynasty Warriors 7, Spirit of Sonata, and now this, that I started caring about the stories in my Warriors games. The script for the story part of the review was two and a half pages long, so it definitely definitely impacts my score. But before I get into summarizing my thoughts on this game and rating it, I'm gonna go over the last three reviews like I did in Musou Mei's past with Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors. So here we go. The first Warriors Orochi was a good exploration of a crossover between the two Warriors series. Without it, we wouldn't have this whole series. That being said, after unlocking the final character Orochi, I feel like there isn't much to do. There also weren't any additional modes beyond story and free, with the latter being pretty useless. The fact we also got a port of this on Xbox 360 and PSP helped me to enjoy the game in HD and on the go. Overall, this game had a decent story and gameplay while not bringing much else to the table. That's why the first Orochi game got a 7.5 out of 10. The sequel is the game I played a lot of growing up. Since this game was also on 360, I went back to it a lot when I got sick and tired of playing Dynasty Warriors 6. It had everything that the first game had and more. It had Dream Mode, which gave us extra what-if stories that had various officers coming together for a one-time battle. It gave us Dynasty Warriors 4 and Samurai Warriors 1 outfits for the first time in HD, and gave us some additional original characters specifically for the Orochi franchise. That being said, it still utilized the Dynasty Warriors 5 and Samurai Warriors 2 designs, movesets, and stages, so it felt more like a Warriors Orochi 1.5, and that's because it was. This was supposed to be an expanded version of the first Orochi game, as we saw with the Japanese exclusive Warriors Orochi Z, which had more content as well. But I still loved playing Warriors Orochi 2, and that's why it got an 8 out of 10. Warriors Orochi 3 was and still is my jam. This was the game I was referencing in my comparison of Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors when I said the Orochi series was the winner. We got a deeper story that involved some time travel and focused on a smaller group of characters. There was lots of nostalgic content both in the base game as well as in the DLC. We got past, modern, and fantasy costumes as well as crossover and strike force outfits. We got crossover weapons, new movesets for the clone characters from Dynasty Warriors 7 and a level cap of 1000. That being said, we also had Gauntlet Mode, which a lot of people loved, but I absolutely hated. Muso Battlefield, a Mario Maker style customizer which wasn't made properly, and graphics that didn't really show off the power of modern consoles. But all those complaints don't amount to much in the grand scheme of things. Warriors Orochi 3 is literally the ultimate package for Warriors fans. That's why I gave it a 9.5 out of 10. And here we are, the latest entry in the Orochi series and the third latest entry in the Warriors franchise. I gave some criticisms on the vanilla game in an unformatted review a few months after its launch. If we didn't get the ultimate expansion, I probably would have given this game a 6.5 out of 10. It was honestly just another Warriors game, but Ultimate saved this title. It just sucked that people had to pay extra to get what they should have gotten in the first place. With a better story and more content that contributes to a higher value of replay, playability, Ultimate is the must-have if you're going to play Warriors Orochi 4, and that's why I give Warriors Orochi 4 Ultimate an 8 out of 10.
I'd honestly say this hits the same mark for me as Warriors Orochi 2. It's a solid experience with the Ultimate Package, though we need a lot more before this game starts feeling like a true sequel to Warriors Orochi 3. I would love to see them release older costumes, weapons, and stages as DLC. Hell, I'd pay for a DLC package that brings back all of the old guest characters, excluding Sofitia. And I'd definitely pay money for the Spirit of Sonata characters. I'd be surprised if they released a DLC pack for all of the All-Stars characters, but I would also throw money at that as well. In fact, if this game offered up more content, I'd probably spend money on it, especially if it feeds my nostalgia. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a lot of achievements and trophies to unlock between Warriors Orochi 2, Z, 3, 3 Ultimate, 4, and 4 Ultimate, so I gotta get jumping on that. But I hope you enjoyed these videos and this year's Muso May. I worked really hard to make them as in-depth as possible without mentioning the stuff that's inconsequential like Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate's color customization. Though that was cool, I didn't really need it in this game. I hope you're all looking forward to next year's Muso May as well. I'll be posting a poll on Twitter to decide the theme for next year before the end of this month, so if you're not following me yet, why not? Go follow Chris underscore Gildart right this instant. You should also follow me on Instagram with the same username. Why not also join my Discord group and chat with me in the community? There's a link in the description if you'd like to join. I'd also recommend giving this video a like, commenting below with your thoughts on Warriors Orochi 4, my revamp story, and Muso Mei in general. While you're down there, subscribe for more pros vs cons reviews and other videos in the works. The next big project is Dynasty Warriors 6 vs Dynasty Warriors 9, so you don't want to miss out on that, so click the notification bell to get told when that gets uploaded. If you'd like to help support the channel even further, you can join the guild like these amazing people that you're seeing on screen right now. You can join them at the end of every single video for just a dollar a month. There's other rewards like a guild only discord channel and early uploads. So check out the links that you see on screen. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all down in the comments.